Good morning. Welcome to the latest installment of the Princeton Class of 79 Authors and Artists series, Feathers and Fins. Our speakers today are Katie Carpenter and George Wood. I'm Bruce Peterson, co-producer of the series with Katherine Ryman and today's moderator. George and Katie will talk for about an hour, followed by a half hour of Q&A. Questions should be submitted using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. The chat function is also enabled for you to message your fellow attendees. George, a lifelong birder, recently celebrated a milestone with the sighting of his 800th species in the US and Canada. I will let George describe the magnitude of that achievement, but trust me, it's a really big deal. Recently, he wrote Bird Tales, A Lifetime Pursuit, which is available on Amazon. The book is full of entertaining narratives and wonderful photos that chronicle his travels and adventures as he chased a goal he set at age 11 and then continued to new heights. Katie, a birder herself, started her career in Audubon's film department. She's a celebrated film producer currently working on three films, Murder at Sea, a documentary tracking the investigations of four marine observers who died aboard large fishing vessels at a time when fewer fish and more desperation have led to drug and human trafficking and murder. Her two short films are Ocean Rescue with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute and Toxic Tide for the Ocean Foundation. The multi-talented Katie is also an author, music video producer, and a consultant on the new aquarium for West Palm Beach, Florida. Katie and George are united in their love of nature and advocacy for our planet. Please join me in welcoming them to the Authors and Artists series. Due to a technical problem for which I take full responsibility, we missed the first minute of the recording. We will join it now as George is responding to a question from Katie about how he got started birding. And I, I knew his grandparents. They were actually my next door neighbors while his grandfather was the head of school where we attended and where I actually work now, the Haverford School. So I was comfortable accepting the invitation at age 10 no parents chaperoning, just Jeff and I visiting the grandparents. And I thought, heck, I'll, I'd never been to Florida. Um, I'll, I'll see some exhibition baseball games and get a suntan. That'll be cool. That's not what happened. Uh, it turned out the Severing House is very serious birders. Every morning, five o'clock a.m., they'd wake us up and toss us in the back of the country squire. And they took us on day trips two places you're certainly familiar with, Lake Okeechobee, the Everglades, the Florida Keys. And during that time, Severing House, he was an educator. He knew how to inspire two young 10-year-olds. He would challenge us to identify birds accurately or first guy to give us a checklist, try to see 100 birds in a day. So it was really the next year I was invited back. I must've been a decent guest. So sixth grade, age 11, spring vacation, it was sort of a wash, rinse, repeat situation, but that's the moment that really stuck for me because I recalled the birds we'd seen the year before and we added more and I just, for some reason, made a pledge or a challenge to myself at that point. I wanna see 600 species of birds by the time I was the impossibly old age of 50. And 50 sounds pretty good now, but I made that, I made that pledge because at the time, Roger Tory Peterson, who you're familiar with and maybe others on, he was the bird guy and his book pictured 645 species. That was sort of the maximum in the late 1960s, that 645 birds are what you could see in the United States and Canada. And I thought, I don't wanna be greedy and expect to see all of them, but I wanna be a hall of famer. And I looked at Peterson 645 as if it was sort of Babe Ruth who had the career home run record of 714. You have to follow my 11 year old mind here. But I thought if I see 600 out of 645, 
That's like Mel Ott, who most people have never heard of, but Mel Ott hit 511 career home runs and was a Hall of Famer. So I just thought, I'm going to be Mel Ott of birding. And that's the goal I set 600. And I always had that in the back of my mind as, as life moved on. As you but, get, I don't want you to get ahead of yourself, George, because I have to remind you that at Audubon, we called obsessed people like you, <laughs> listers and twitchers. And a twitcher was especially beloved because that was a person who would read on eBird, oh, there's a calliope hummingbird east of the Mississippi. It's in it, Manhattan. And they would all go with their scopes and they'd be out there watching this bird. It, Is that the it, kind of person you became? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think the twitching term did come from the Brits. And you, you hear about a new bird and you twitch and you, oh. Uh, <laughs> Gotta go. I, I like to think I can step back from myself and sort of laugh at me, but my kids keep me in my place. And they're like, no, you're, you're one of them, dad. You're one of them. But anyway, I went on a bit of a monologue there just to set the foundation. And before I talk about my book, I think I want to pass it over to you because I didn't know you were an author as well. And that sort of takes us back in the timeline, doesn't it? To, to the beginning after school and how, yeah, to you know, what, how you got interested in nature and things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. Well, one of my first assignments um, was for National Geographic was to do a short film on uh, dolphin language. And they sent us to Hawaii to the Koala Marine Mammal Basin where we filmed scientists over the course of about three weeks who were teaching dolphins our language and in turn were learning from dolphins their language of clicks and whistles and what and what they meant and of course their syntax and their vocabulary were much larger than anybody knew so that was a it was a very exciting time we were in the tanks with the dolphins and uh you know that was as close as i'd ever gotten until then i you know my stories were always kind of at a distance so um you know, I was really into birds too, but I didn't have the knack like you have, George. So I went for marine mammals. <laughs> that was my well, like. My if favorite. you don't mind, let me let me stop you there. So you're a comp lit major at Princeton. Your first job out of college was like, how did you get that job? I would have loved that job. I couldn't get a job. <laughs> yeah, no, I had to struggle. I scraped. I worked at PBS and then I worked at uh, ABC News. Mm -hmm. And when I got the call to go on this location uh, for National Geographic, I was actually replacing somebody who had um, who had failed to show up basically at the airport. I had to make a decision mm -hmm. in a overnight and got on this plane to, to Hawaii without any idea. We did, a, we did a film about dolphins and another one about whale song. And you know, by the end of that six weeks, I was completely hooked. So wow. I didn't want to go back to the news uh, job, even though now, of course, I'm obsessed with what's going on in the news because everything is as interconnected now. We got climate change and conservation and biodiversity and everything's on the news. I wish I was at ABC News so I could help cover all that stuff. But basically, no, I just, I fell in love with dolphins. So many people do. They're so human. They're so like us. They have expression. They have, you know, incredible family behaviors. Well, Flipper, so, didn't, didn't we all grow up watching Flipper? <laughs> right, Flipper, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, the guy who produced Flipper is now a huge ocean activist. I mean, you, you don't need to spend too long with marine mammals before you want to work to save the ocean. There's just no question about it. So the book came about because by that point, a few years later, I was working for for um, Discovery Channel. And we did a film based on um, this incredible story that we ran into in New Orleans. Well, actually I was in New Orleans filming and then we heard this story that over in Gulfport, Mississippi at the Oceanarium there, when, the, when Hurricane Katrina came in, it just scraped Gulfport, everything was gone, including the Oceanarium and the sea turtles and the sea lions were being found all over the place. They were not, um, nothing was left in the oceanarium and the eight dolphins that lived there were just gone. They just were presumed dead. And then one day when we were, you know, just a few miles away, we heard on the, on the NOAA scanner that eight dolphins had been spotted like 10 miles out at sea, eight dolphins mm -hmm. doing synchronized somersaults mm -hmm. in the middle of the ocean. And they're like, oh, wow, that's, those are dolphins from a dolphin show. You know, what are they doing out there? And sure enough, there they were, they were skinny and one was sick. One had a stingray barb in his head, but it was an incredible story. Over the next couple of weeks, they rescued each one, hauled them up onto mats that the Navy had provided. 
and brought them back into um, Gulfport. And Gulfport, which had lost so many people at all their homes, basically, and tons of uh, fishing vessels. And here were the dolphins rescued and found, and they set up a tank for them right in the middle of the town, and everybody came to see them. And, and they stayed there for a long time. So those dolphins became symbolic of something like hope. And when, um, when we put the film on Discovery, we got a call saying, let's do, let's do a book about this. And this wonderful publisher, Tenley mm -hmm. Circle Press, took it on. And my sister, Mary Carpenter, who's actually a writer, was able to help shape the film script into a book. I am a fake writer. I make TV. <laughs> She's what, a real what was the date? When did this first when did this first come out? So this was about a year after Katrina. So the film aired right after Katrina, maybe um, a month later. And then uh, and then it took a year, ugh, more than a year to do the book. How long did it take yeah. to you to do your book, George? Oh, yeah. You want me to launch into that? It, it just takes a long time. I mean, just explain. Yeah. You can't do it like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had a bit of a head start now. I didn't just write the book from scratch but I did achieve this number that Bruce referred to, the 800 number, I think it was September, 2021. And most people who aren't birders, you know, seeing 800 birds in America, really loosely United States and Canada, what does that mean? Well, I have to say, and it's a bit of a, a, bit of a brag, I guess, but the experts claim that there are less than 100 living people in the world that have seen 800 or more species of birds in the United States or Canada. And as you know, there are a lot of Europeans and South Americans and obviously Americans that bird watch. We all have sort of a world list, but most people don't have the time or the money to pick up and accumulate a decent world list. So it is the American, US, Canada list that's kind of the brag card for people that are halfway serious about birding. So yeah, I reached this number of 800 and I thought it's worth memorializing, at least for me, maybe maybe for my kids and maybe, you know, friends like this. And, and I, I will go back and say though, I didn't write it from scratch because maybe 15 years ago, my oldest, Sarah, suggested to me, she, she said, hey dad, I know you have a lot of these bird stories and these great adventures, but we kids don't always want to hear your stories when you want to tell them, you know, gut punch, like, oh, really? And she went on to say, but I have an idea, dad. I think I can help you create a blog. And with that, I've been able to basically chronicle my favorite stories, always punctuated with humor and at least one hopefully decent photograph. So over the course of the last 15 years, I guess it was during COVID, I reached this 800 number. I assembled what I thought were my favorite stories and added a little sort of connected tissue. So there was some flow and rhythm to it and voila, pr produced this book, which Yes, is available on Amazon for twenty nine ninety five. <laughs> well, you want to so. tell Sarah, your daughter. Well, first of all, you should give her a credit on the book, and yeah. second of all, second of all, you can tell her that you didn't torture her and her siblings the way I tortured my daughters because I was working in video. So every time I came back from one of these great stories, I made them look at a rough cut of something, and so they yeah. they got sick of me way earlier than your kids got sick of you. I should think, and plus I dragged them everywhere for you know. Thanksgiving in Botswana and their birthdays in Costa Rica. And those kids were, they were sick of the whole National Geographic lifestyle pretty quick. Uh, they, were, they were good when they were little, they were really into it. <laughs> but, you know, both of my daughters, by the time they hit middle school, they were like, mom, you know, it was really fun to eat crested cara cara for turkey in Costa Rica. But can we please go have like a normal Thanksgiving? <laughs> And it just you want at least one of your daughters. You told me. I mean, they're adults now. Is following your path, doing the documentary. Yeah, my older daughter Revel is now an actress. I mean, she started in finance. They both started in mm -hmm. finance, but Revel couldn't take it. So she she was good at giving presentations, and they put her into like a PowerPoint class, and yeah. you know, she got cast in a Lifetime horror movie, and the rest is history. <laughs> wow. 
<laughs> hey, I, I know that you and I were reconnected thanks to our friend Stu Schultz, who I believe is on this call. Hey, so, Stu. Yes, yeah, Stu. Um, I didn't remember. Are we are we going to segue into into your Stu the the Jimmy Buffett piece? Well, or? you know what? We should tell Stu to come up with a funny question for the end and put it in okay. the chat, and then and then we can tell all of his dirty laundry on air. But I don't know that we would do that otherwise, <laughs> right, Stu? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, I didn't know if that this was a chance you wanted to talk about the music yeah. video. Yeah. Well, I can say that, you know, I mean, it's a it's a reasonable thing to say after talking about how I tortured my children with all this video activity, because I was literally chasing my favorite animals around the world for so many years. And I still caught their piano recitals. I was still there for the soccer games and everything, but I was missing in distant places for some of the time and they yeah. and they fortunately I think they've uh, they've forgiven me now but we had um some of it was good like the Jimmy Buffett music video was fantastic like what little girl doesn't want to go to a rock concert in the right. middle of a Caribbean island <laughs> like yeah all right yeah. let's do that wow, wow. And, uh, we did the music video to that song fins that was playing at the beginning and of course we turned it into a shark education video um, because that song is about sharks, but not like you would have thought. So it, you know, it it all turned out pretty well. And I owe Stu Schultz and John Colan thanks yes. to that from the world of Margaritaville, which we love always. So I can't yeah. help but pitch that. But you know, oh, I would fun. say that my um, chasing uh, these animals all over the world to to Indonesia and Palau and all the places that I went, it it got a little bit. Um, sadder as I went, you know, because I would go back to places where I had been and the animals that were common were now reduced in number and they would be hard yeah. to find. And uh, yeah. I want to say that one of the, you know, they would always challenge us to make adventure stories out of our conservation stories. And that's how this movie Chasing the Thunder came about. And I think um, yeah. Bruce has a poster of that, of that movie because Chasing the yeah. Thunder is playing now on um, Discovery Plus on streaming. And it has it has the benefit of having a bunch of guys from Sea Shepherd in the foreground and our two camera crews in the background following a 110 day chase oh, all yeah. the way up, all the way up the coast of Africa to the place where they scuttled their ship. The poachers scuttled their ship right. off the coast of uh, Nigeria. And, you know, people don't know, oh, yeah, that's great. You had two camera crews for 110 days. Think of, think of the math. We had 900 hours of footage in that edit room. Oh, my goodness. We had to go through to make that story happen and, and also all the stories for the Ocean Warriors series. So, oh. I, you know, I've fallen in love with a lot of weird animals, but chili and sea bass, which was the, uh, the seafood that was uh, featured in, in Chasing the right. Sun, is actually a Patagonian toothfish. Two fish, right? Like a huge piranha. It's like a horrible, horrible fish. I don't think I've ever ordered chili and sea bass, so I'm not guilty there. But I did Good. watch the trailer and learn that. I had no idea. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think the euphemism, so, or yeah, that's sort of a made-up commercial name. That some chef made it, it up. Sells in restaurants, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, if you see chili and sea bass on the menu, you really should not eat it. Excellent. In fact, you should educate the waiter. <laughs> Take this off. Oh wow. Um, if wow. there's anything that you do. But it's been a great ride. It really has. It's been a great adventure. And all of this, and still I get seasick. Oh. Oh well, you would you wouldn't do well on some of my adventures, but um, <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. I know yeah. You've been all over the place. Well, I speaking of kids, and I guess I'm gonna mention a lot of people ask me, you know, I have six kids actually, um, four from the first marriage that are they you know people say well, are they birders and and how did you influence them and i'll say i did expose my kids to nature early yeah and hike became a four letter word for them oh good bruce put this up yeah i i introduced them to all kinds of things including falconry i don't think there's a smile on any of those four kids faces and i did turn that into a holiday card because I thought it was fun. <laughs> um, but there is a significant, this, this picture cues me to recall a moment. Second from the right is my youngest, Carly. And there was a moment she was in her early teens and we were playing basketball and I was giving her the usual positive parenting remarks, try your best, 
reach your goals. And she stopped the dribble and looked at me and said, dad, whatever happened to that goal of yours to see a bunch of birds? And I looked at her and I said, oh, right. Yeah, I wanted to see 600 birds in America by the time I was 50, but I'm now 52, so I missed my opportunity. And she looked at me and said, dad, we lived in England for six years. I think you should subtract the six and you're really only 46 years old. You need to pursue your goal. And I'm like, Oh my God, she was like 13. I'm like, you know what? I, I had time and, and recently divorced. So I had more time than I probably wanted. And it was that moment. I was probably in the five sixties or five seventies. And then I really did accelerate my, my pursuit of seeing what was originally 600, but became 800 birds. So I have to give her credit there. But I, anyway. I just, I'm completely flabbergasted. I mean, people don't know. I hung around Audubon for a long time. You know, I was the requisite Jaws and Claws person. All I did were big, you know, charismatic mega fauna for my films. And I didn't know that much about birds. And when I started learning about birds from the other people at Audubon, I realized how impressive those numbers are, George. I mean, 600, mm. and I know you're going for more. That yeah. is a lot of birds. I mean, yeah. really, that's impressive. I, I'm excited. Yeah. I mean, I guess we're not that young. I mean, I, you know, over 50 years, I, I never lost track of my lists. They were handwritten for years and then computerization in the 90s. Um, although I do remember when we moved to England and I had my, all my bird lists on the computer, I plugged it into the wrong socket or something and it completely blew up. So <laughs> I, I actually lost all my computerized records, but I still had my manual records. So I re inputted all of that. And now Cornell University has the ability to keep track of everything you'd ever want to know about birds. So wow, yeah, it's so a marathon. Cool. It's, it's a, I guess it's just a marathon. Not a yeah. And so a lot of us have seen that movie, The Big Year with Jack oh, and Steve Martin. Yes. Those people were like crazy. But are you are you going to do a big year? I guess your whole uh, life is a big year. Uh, you know, I sort of I have not done a big year officially, but I did have a year that was really big just because, and I traveled a lot for work and for birding. But yeah, that leads into probably my favorite story of all my stories, which does involve a classmate of ours. And yeah, maybe Bruce can cue up the, the poster of the big year so people know what this, this, this movie came out in October, 2011. And it bombed. Most of you probably never heard of the movie, even though it had a cast with Jack Black and Owen Wilson and Steve Martin, marquee names. And it was about three guys that were trying to see as many birds as they could in one year, based on a true story on a book written in 2004. So, oh good, there we go. Yeah, I have this poster in this house in Vermont. Uh, despite protests from other members of the household, this is featured in the house. And what's significant for me is that I went to the opening with my oldest son, Carrie, he was probably 21. And you know, the movie actually has great music, great photos. If people had bothered to watch it, I think they would have liked it. I've probably seen it 15 times. And, and what's really funny, it was, <laughs> At the end of the movie, Jack Black says to Steve Martin, you know, my friend Jeff Shaw says the pink-footed goose is somewhere. And then Steve Martin retorts, pink-footed goose? What's Jeff Shaw been smoking? My son and I are watching this on the big screen in a movie theater, and we both jumped out of our seats and are like, wait, Jeff Shaw? As many of you know, he's been my great, great friend since kindergarten through Haverford School, through Princeton, New York, and, uh, and life. And hopefully he and his roommates are listening to this because I know they're hiking somewhere in Colorado, but he promised to check in. But that 
was just a crazy moment. My son is like, dad, do the producers of the movie know you or something? Like, why did they use that name, Jeff Shaw? Believe me, I tried hard to find that out. I contacted a lot of folks. I never found out why. But what was significant as well for me in my quest was at this time, I was sitting on 599, October 2011. And a month later, our family joined the Shaw family at a Princeton Yale football game. So it's November. And of course the Shaws had seen the movie because I requested it and they knew that I was on the cusp of setting this goal of 600. And, and uh, you know, they're asking me, well, you can script it, you can plan it. You, you know, there's gotta be a bird out there you haven't seen, what are you gonna do? And, I, and I, I said, you know, I haven't really had a chance to think about it. I've been working too much, whatever. But yes, 600 needs to be special. And at that point, Jeff and Jeannie's son, Max, who was an undergrad at Princeton and with us, he looked at me, he goes, Woody, it's obvious. It needs to, to be the pink-footed goose. And I said, oh yeah, oh great, Max, I get that. But that bird's been seen maybe once or twice in America ever. It's a, it's a Eurasian, Greenland, Iceland bird. But at halftime, I went ahead and Googled pink-footed goose North America. And lo and behold, there was one being seen in Nova Scotia. So a week later, the next Saturday, I did find myself in Nova Scotia. I had met quickly that week, a couple of the key birders in Halifax. We corresponded on phone and internet and they met me at the airport and we divided up into two cars, Dave and I in one car, John in the other and had walkie talkies and the fields that we, that, so they took us out to the soybean fields where there were thousands of Canada geese. It was sort of a fine Waldo needle in a haystack. And I'm just shaking my head going, I must be nuts. Like there's no chance I'm gonna see the one pink-footed goose in all this territory. And I'm in the car with Dave and then the walkie talkie crackles. John says, the bird is headed our way. It's with a bunch of Canada geese flying towards our car. And it was maybe, this was mid-November, but still like 20 degrees. I didn't dress properly. I didn't even bother to get out of the car. I'm in the passenger seat. And lo and behold, I see these birds coming at us. I got the binoculars on. I could see that one bird was different than the other seven or eight. I more or less convinced myself that that was the pink-footed goose. And then I realized, oh my God, I need to get a picture. I've got the blog, no one will believe me. I need to get a picture. I fumbled, I got the big old camera and just shot it out of the passenger window. And here you go, click, click, click. And I was able to capture this photo circled in red is the pink footed goose. All, all I can tell you is it looks different than the Canada geese, but I do promise you that is number 600. I love so, that. Yeah. Thank Quite you a relief. so much. <laughs> and, and these two guys, these two guys were complete strangers. Turns out they're actually pretty big deal Canada birders. They had the champagne out ready for me. It, there's a picture in the book and we had a big toast and I didn't even spend the night. I got home the same day back to Philadelphia. So the Jeff Shaw 600 pink footed goose. It, it, yeah, <laughs> I, I can't do any better than that, to be honest. <laughs> I love that. I love that yeah. story so much. Yay, Jeff Shaw. Yeah. I have. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I was, was just going to say, is that, the, is that the bird that's flying backwards? It looks well, like that bird is flying backwards. It does look like that. But no, his head's to the left following the others. And I'm kidding. Strange looking thing. But, picture. but, you know, you I, I want to get back to you. I mean, I'm sort of this domestic U.S person, but your travels are global, which I'm really envious of. And I thought maybe you want to detail some more of your, of your, <laughs> your favorite stories or, you know, I have. Well, your, 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 your stuff is pulling me off script, George, because it's too good. I do want to say, I want to yeah. give, uh, give a shout out to my college roommate, Emily Todd, who is a Yay. way better birder than I am. And she would be very impressed with your story. And she's the one who took me on my first international birdathon. 
Oh. When you work at Audubon, you're required to do a birdathon every, it's, they pick a day in the middle of April and you have to see as many birds as you can see in a 24 hour period. Right. And then wherever you, so you go to a place where you know there's gonna be a lot of birds either on the migration route or somewhere else. And then you have to write a bird report, which in my case was a film, of course. So she took us down with a couple of other people from Audubon to Trinidad. Oh, wow. Like April 15th or something, 14th. And, um, you know, you start at midnight, you go, you get coffee, you go, people have scoped along the way where the birds are going to be. And then you come back in at 1159 at night. And yep. it is crazy fun time and I was exhausted the whole thing just completely blew my mind but Emily was like ready for more she's a real bird <laughs> she had her scope and her binocs yeah. and everything so I I I have had respect for birders for a long did, time you do, do you remember your number I, I've never been to Trinidad Tobago it's on the list I haven't been but you must have had yeah. some great one 134 so it wasn't that high. yeah That's I know that I know that we were probably horsing around a little bit because, you know, there was cocktail hour at five o'clock and all of that. We didn't use our time as well as we could have. <laughs> yeah, but the no. last thing now that we, we did film later was the uh, World Series of Birding, which is in New Jersey. I, I, I've supported that from the beginning, 1984. Yes. So shooting that was fun because we had to put six camera crews on the different locations. They already knew where they were going to have to go and go as fast as they could. And John I, Fitzpatrick was on the principal, the guy from oh. Cornell was our I, main character. I tried to get hired. He was, he ran Cornell's lab of ornithology. I'm a fundraiser and I was not pleased with things maybe 10 years ago at my school. I tried to get hired as a remote major gift person for, and hired by Fitzpatrick well, don't to work give up. for Cornell. You know, he's here right now. He's here doing the scrub jays. At really? Yeah, you should come down. Yeah. You know, the scrub jay story is amazing, but I won't go there yeah. because I'm on fins, not feathers. No, so I, I, come back yes, to feathers. yeah, but oh, wow. <laughs> wow, that's, that's, that's impressive, but. We have, well, we have a lot of, a lot of crossover. Well, I think that I should, I should probably admit that the reason why my documentaries have gotten a little bit darker over the, over the years is because mm -hmm. spending time on this story reveals more than you really want to know about what's happening to the natural world. And of course, growth is a great thing, but in some places you, it needs to be managed a little bit better. And so when we went out to sea, the story switched to criminality at sea. Ah, uh, yes. Like, uh, the poster that Bruce has for, for murder at sea, or maybe even, do you have a trailer, Bruce? I think- um, Yeah, let's check it out. A short video on that. Yeah, just to see where that story leads. Wow. Basically, I was filming in Fiji for a month and in Ghana for a month. It's a good you, thing did you ever feel that you were endangered? I hope, I hope uh, not. Well no. protected, bodyguards, Kevlar. Wow, wow. This is our Pacific Ocean. Sometimes I wish it can talk, tell us what has happened. Tuna. It's seen as a commodity, but it's so much more. Tuna, quite simply, are the world's most valuable fish. The Pacific has the last remaining healthiest tuna fishery, and it's declining. The observers on fishing vessels, their role is to document illegal fishing practices on the high seas. Secrecy is king in the fishing industry. I think that's this enough, Chris. So we, I, you know, it leaves me speechless, really, that so many people have died at sea without being uh, properly investigated. Wow. And was, I think I told you on Monday we're, we're filming one more, which is one of the observers that was killed in Panama. And I, you know, we just went over the questions and sent the crew on the plane. And, and I just think that um, it's just one of those shocking stories that hopefully will raise people's awareness about what is going on uh, with, with uh, crimes at sea. And you know they say, oh, that's the you know these fishing vessels are are smuggling drugs and they're doing human trafficking and all these terrible things are going. But actually, there's murder going on. So we try to tell that story only because if we could beat back the illegal wow. fishing, we could save some more fish. We hope. Wow. So not just to eat, but to to love. You know what's going on with whales right now. And this, I don't know if you saw the story this morning about the cruise ship that ran into the Faroe Islands harbor and bumped into the whale hunt. And no, I was doing too much laundry here. I'm, I'm <laughs> You're doing the laundry. But I mean, yeah. there's terrible stories all around the world and we get, we become immune, you know? So we have to find new ways to tell those stories. And you uh, too, George, I mean, you, you're you out in the wild all the time. You must yeah. long to protect some of those wonderful creatures that you follow. 
Yeah, when I'm when I'm not in a coat and tie strapped to my desk at the school or chasing some ball on a racket court, I do try to get out into some some areas. Um, I thought, and I'll, I'll cue Bruce up. I, I do. I have one fun story, or one uh, another fun story, and it's going to be the great gray owl story because. Uh, in, or, in order to get beyond 600, I guess I should explain that when I hit 600, I thought that was nice, but because of the advent of technology, the increased popularity of birding, uh, remote areas like Alaska being opened up, to me, there was what I call birdflation. The 600 number was no longer that significant. I knew I needed to reach 700 to satisfy that 11-year-old's mind that had made the challenge to himself to get to 600. So yeah, birding is a disease, it's an addiction, you just keep going. And one of the places I needed to go to get this rare Arctic owl is, is in the Saks Zimbog, which is an area above Duluth, Minnesota, pretty remote. And, and you go there in February where they have a festival, an annual festival and I, I can tell you, I, the first day I was out with a van and a leader and we, we went to this area where there were lots of great, not lots, a couple of great gray owls in the distance, not great looks and certainly not good enough for a photograph, but they, the leader sort of ushered us back in the van, said you need to go back to the conference center because they had an author, uh, Paul Bannock, pretty good guy talking about his new owl and woodpecker book. And I go back and the whole group is in this auditorium, more like a makeshift Quonset hut. And I had this idea. I thought, heck, if everybody's here, why don't I just ditch the talk and go back out where we saw those owls at a distance a few hours earlier, and I might have a chance to getting a great photograph. And that's what you're looking at on the screen. It's probably 3 p.m. Uh, in February, sun is almost setting and the light was right in his eyes. So I am pretty proud of that photograph, but here's the sort of more humorous part of the story. I wasn't alone. Within 10 minutes of taking this picture, some other guy showed up. We had rental cars. And, his name is Gustav Axelson, and he is still a senior person at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. But at the time, he was also a part-time reporter for the New York Times. So this becomes my paragraph of fame story because he thought I was pretty funny. I was just over the moon that I'd gotten these great photographs on the fancy digital camera. And I, I don't know what I was saying or doing, but he decided to write about me. And a month later, yes, there it is. He wrote about the festival, the Minnesota Bog Festival of Birds. That is his photo, not mine, but that bird was that close to us, just flying at us. So anyway, it was, it was just, it was a chapter in the book, but I'll never make the New York Times, except for up here at Ludlow, Vermont, in the middle of the mudslides. <laughs> but anyway, so I wanted that. to get that story out because that was <laughs> so fun. Um, I love that story. I love that owl. That's an incredible looking bird. I yeah. think um, it reminds me, I think I told you, I, I did have a few random bird film experiences. And one of them was chasing the whooping cranes that were being, um, yeah. they were being redirected to learn how to migrate to a new place because the old place that they were migrating to was gone. Right. Basically, there was, it was now a housing development. And the cool thing is that we were following George Archibald. And George yeah. Archibald was the, the famous guy who danced with cranes and made them, yeah. you know, come into breeding plumage, breeding conditions yeah. so that they could have. Yeah. I mean, he was an incredible guy. And he would, and speaking of chasing around, I mean, in rental cars, we had people in, um, I would say, six vans, uh, maybe three camera crews. and. Yeah following these these sand, these whooper cranes right and they would be hiding inside the sandhill cranes so they yeah. had to and the way you raise them to get them to do this i mean you basically have to go when they're still in the eggs yeah. and play the sound of the ultralight airplane 
Brrr. It's like some sort of imprinting or something. So they it's imprint like, on yeah. the sound of the airplane and right. the voice of the pilot. And, and there's, you know, two or three different planes. So there's each group has a different group. So when they hatch out of the egg, you turn on the ultralight engine and they're like, mm. and they walk it out of the garage and onto the runway. I mean, it was incredible. So they right. would take these planes. The planes would go flying off from each location early in the morning and the and the whoopers would be behind them going what do they do george oh very good <laughs> you, you, you could be in you could be in the big year you could be that could be in the, big year. Did the bird calls <laughs> uh, yeah. but i mean it's really it's incredible what you do to capture these these stories and these bird ids people really have little idea i think george has a picture of me with jeff corwin in indonesia yes I mean, Jeff Corwin took us all over the place because he had written a book called 100 Heartbeats. And 100 yeah. Heartbeats was, you can't really tell, it's kind of fuzzy. So oh Jeff Corwin had written this book about the 100 most endangered species in the world. And he wanted to go see every single one of them. He, so he's I, like the, he's the animal planet guy. I mean, I was a huge yes. fan of Steve Irwin and Jeff yeah. Corwin. Like yeah, you're, you're, yeah. you're playing hardball now, dropping some big names. <laughs> I, I, Jeff Corwin's well, a hero. I wish everybody knew Jeff Corwin because he really is so talented. He's so smart and he's so natural on camera. But we haven't been able to get enough airtime for him, but we're still we're still working on it. He's second and from he, the right. He's second from yeah, the right. Yeah, he's second from the right, right next to me, looking really sweaty and hot carrying yeah. the sound equipment. So, wow. we, so we would go into these locations and look for birds and fish that I had never even heard of. He would be able to identify and get us there. And when we were in Indonesia, we did uh, two stories. We did orangutans and we did um, sea turtles. And the incredible thing about the sea turtle story is that it didn't go at all the way we thought it would. We went, we got in the boat, we went out to these crazy islands off the coast of Jakarta, about 10 miles north of Jakarta. We filmed the sea turtles being rehabbed and the babies being released on the beach. It was all very, you know, we're all very uh, emotional. And then we got back on the boat and head to head back to Jakarta. And we run into this like landmass that wasn't there when we left. Like wow. all of a sudden there's a landmass in the middle of the ocean. What is this? Oh, it's the Pacific Garbage Island. Oh. It's not the big one. It's a little baby because now that big Pacific Island uh, made out of plastic has wow. little islands out of plastic all over the place. So we ran into one, of course, Jeff Corman, who, uh, he, I think he might be, he's, well, he was having like a, a very exhilarated moment. And he said, I want to jump into that plastic island and see what it's like, because we've been hearing about these plastic islands and taking over the ocean and I wanna see what it's like. And we're like, no, no, you know, I'm thinking <laughs> insurance. And do I have oh, the God. insurance? Yes. He jumps off the boat cameraman is so excited he gets the picture and he he comes up and he's like oh my god this is so disgusting because the plastic melts you know and it like has oh tests god down and it's like so disgusting mm. and it goes on for as far as you can see and he just wanted to make the point he actually did a stand-up or what we call a stand-up from you know in the ocean in the plastic saying this is you know we're headed to very bad times unless we can cur curtail this and he oh and it's bad for sea turtles but it's bad for everybody so he came back on the boat. And of course, in the end, in the film, that was the that was the climax. So we didn't get to talk about the sea turtles as much as we thought we would because we ran into the big Pacific Island, uh, plastic island. But is, is Cor can I just ask, is Corin yeah. like a PhD or something? Like he's, no, he's, he's like what, a what is he? auto autodidact. Jeff Corwin taught himself about animals. He started as a snake guy. He was a herpetologist. Oh, and he wow. did snakes and then he did frogs. And it's fun when you're on location with him because he, he doesn't want to ever sleep or stop doing what he does. So he'll he'll come up with activities for everybody. So for us, he said, let's go on a frog walk. Meet me at 2 a.m. We're like, what? We don't need to sleep. And he would, he would always have amazing stories to tell. And he's written a new book and he's trying to, I think he's going to put it on Discovery Channel. Oh, wow. I'm, oh, I'm a huge yeah. fan. That's great. That's yeah. that's. It. It was wow. fun to work with him. I mean, you you work with incredible people too, right? In your chase for the well, what is I, the next goal? I pay I pay oh. incredible people to lead me. I, again, I'm just an amateur. <laughs> I have great respect for the leaders. I mean, in another life, I would love to have been a guide or an eco tourist person. But back when we graduated from college, there there were there weren't a lot of role models, or mm. I didn't think I could make a living chasing 
birds, but mm, yeah. that's right. That's right. Well, it's just a hobby. It's not too late, George. You know, yeah. I mean, this could be the beginning of your broadcast career. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is fun. It's, it's fun. Um, I am cognizant of time and I'm wondering, um, I want I know we both have other areas we wanted to talk about. Um, yeah, I don't know, Bruce, you'll give us a sign. Bruce I'm will give us a sign. Say I, one I, thing about your Lake Okeechobee reference, which is, I'm just going to say this one thing, at Lake Okeechobee, yeah. when you went there years ago and saw right. your great my, Cara and your my sand Cara Hill Cara crane. Sandhill Crane, 1968, my life for birds, and Lake Okeechobee was just yeah. remote and pristine and, and gorgeous. And it was so and, beautiful, and, yeah. And that's not the case now, is it? This is, this is the front page of Monday's New York Times. Oh, and brother. we have, we were asked by one of our funder foundations to go out and film this. And it it's really, it's not, it's not a happy place. Lake Okeechobee is in so much trouble. And we have oh. to look after our water bodies, you know, because there's birds in there and there's fish in there and they, they need this water to be clean. So oh. I think um, it's really interesting that you were there in 1968 when I yep. had never heard of it and couldn't even pronounce it. Yep. And, and, uh, and now it's in the news again. But you know, uh, it, it's never too late to clean these places up and to raise awareness about this. And you know, I think it's wow. worth doing. Yeah, let's go back to Okeechobee sometime, George. Oh no, I'd, I'd love to. I do have, my oldest lives in Miami. Um, it's it's always funny when I when I visit her, she's like, are you here to see me or is there some rare bird in the neighborhood? <laughs> <She> can... <laughs> Lately, it's, it's been the latter. I had to chase a couple of rare ones, but I was able to <laughs> see, take, take her to dinner as well, which she liked. But I'm, well, come thinking, down here and we'll go see a reddish egret. So I, I, for those that know me, I'm not a risk taker, but I'm going to, I'm going to give you the 700 story. Just so you know, obviously, you know, I reached 800, but it's a kind of funny, a funny story uh, to reach 700. I, I did have, have to book a trip to Alaska. Somehow I made Seattle a business trip and then jumped over to Alaska where I knew I could, I was in the, I was at 699 actually, and I knew I'm gonna get to this 700 number, but the day, I had an extra day before the tour that I signed up for on the Pribilof Islands, which are a group of islands above the Aleutians. So I had this extra day and I'd heard that uh, a, an Aleutian turn, which is kind of unusual, you're only gonna see it in Alaska, but also not guaranteed to see in Alaska, I went to Headquarters Lake, which is south of Anchorage in the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge. And oddly, at the time, there was this fire going on, which became national news. But there was a report that there was Aleutian terns nesting on the lake. So I, I got to the refuge. I met the manager, Toby. He had a scope. I did not. I couldn't see anything with the binoculars. So he joins me out on the platform. And he goes, there's your birds. I got to go back to the office and he trudges back off and he, and he said, by the way, don't have, don't even think about going on the water. And, and he left and I'm sort of perplexed, like, wait a minute, that was not a very satisfactory look through his scope, two dots. I'm always thinking I need a picture for the blog, if nothing else, you know, and I'm thinking that, that these birds are half a mile away across the lake. And there were seaplanes that were now diving into the lake to collect the water to help put out the fire, which was not successful because this fire went on for a couple of weeks. And I was hoping for an impossible flyby. Maybe the, maybe the turn's gonna fly over my head and I'll get my picture. And, I, and after about 20 minutes, I realized that's not gonna happen. And I'm thinking, why did he, why, why did he mention don't go on the lake? Like, I'm not gonna swim. And there was this fence, maybe 200 yards down to my right and a big 12 foot fence that jutted into the lake so that I could have waded to my chest to get around the fence to where there was an overturned rowboat on the shore, which I hadn't noticed, but I guess he figured I would have figured this out. I scaled the fence, I dropped down 12 feet, almost broke my leg. The optics were clanging, but thankfully weren't broken and turned over this, this object, which was a rowboat with two oars and a life preserver. And again, I'm, I'm not really a risk taker, but the excitement and the knowledge that those birds are out there. I, got, I, got a, I don't care about these seaplanes and 40 mile an hour winds. The place, the place was the, the, you know, cresting, the, 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 the lake looked like 
a hurricane, but I managed to row out there maybe, maybe 30, 40 minutes it took me. And I, I think Bruce has the picture. I did capture number 700. There we go. The Aleutian turn. And to most people that just looks like some strange seabird, but I promise you the white forehead is the diagnostic uh, mark that distinguishes this turn from any other turn you might've heard of, common Arctic roseate. So yeah, I had to tell that story because it was just too fun. And it really was out of character for me. I did end up going back to the refuge and I was so excited and I, Toby was this big guy, didn't smile much. And he just looked at me and said, I knew you were going to go do that. And I later sent him a big thing of Omaha steaks as a thank you, because I thought he was going to bust me. But anyway. <laughs> George, yeah. you have to come down here. We have sandwich turns and Caspian turns and all these crazy turns, like right out my window. I know you're, you're, you're very ah. fortunate to live where you are, but it's now, I know we're running out of time, but I, what, you're, you're up to some pretty cool stuff currently and locally with the aquarium. Do you mind filling us in on yeah, what you're doing yeah. right now? You're far well, from retirement. That's two reasons why you need to come down here. You can come visit our, our cool turns and you can come and see our aquarium when it's so ready. What are you, what are you so, doing with this aquarium? What is, well, what is your role? I, I'm on the board of the local science museum and they raised money to do a, uh, to build an aquarium and a digital exhibit gallery. And at National Geographic, we used to do these digital uh, exhibit gallery projects. And we mm -hmm. did one on the ocean called Ocean Odyssey. And it played in Times Square. And it was this great inter interactive, immersive sort of experience. And, uh, and I said, well, we, you know, we have to do that one better. We raised all this money. Let's build a, just a huge place where we can offer the ocean experience to kids and their families, everybody who comes all over South Florida, all the way. They come from Miami. They come from Orlando. It's a big audience that they have. And um, basically we're, we're building this, it's gonna be cool. It's like the kids will walk into the gallery. It'll be like they're walking on the ocean floor and the fish will be scurrying away under their feet as their feet step, the fish will swim away. Cool. And we'll lead them straight into the big gallery, which has, you know, 40 foot screens, five 40 foot screens to create an immersive experience and marine creatures will come, you know, will sense their, their proximity and will come swimming right up to them. And the, wow. and the best part about this, I think, has been working with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute because they yep. are the best uh, researchers about the ocean, especially the deep ocean. And I think I gave uh, Bruce a picture of the little... Um, octopus. Yes. We, I mean, yes. we have so many creatures that are going to be in the actual aquarium whose stories can be told in this digital gallery. And yeah, I took oh, wow. that's a terrible picture, but basically octopus are incredible. You know, you, you put your hand in the tank and they crawl up your arm like this. They want to say hello. They want to know who you are. <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah. So I think these, uh, you know, this closeness to marine life that we're going to be able to offer uh, you know, it could make a it could make a big difference because I'm no uh, fool. I realize that films are not going to save the planet. We're going to have to do right. more. We're going to have to send this message and and be much more emphatic about the way we we talk about these incredible species that need to be saved. So right. come, George, come see the turns. Come see the. Oh. Come see I the will. And <laughs> maybe 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 we'll close. You, you know, I'm, maybe I'll bring it home and and. Uh, the the if we the 800 we could show the photo of number 800 which was a it's a cool name the Siberian Accentor it's really a Russian sparrow I I had to go back to Alaska of course um, and and that and it's it's the Siberian Accentor I think I sent Bruce the sounds picture. like something out of Harry Potter yeah yeah he was number eight 800 um, but again you don't stop there we go. Pretty cool bird, but you know, not uncommon in Russia. But I was on an island. I'm I'm thinking Sarah Palin, but I literally was 20 miles from Russia and could see it from St. Lawrence Island, which is part of Alaska, therefore part of the United States. And I was there in the fall when these when these vagrants get blown over from you know their migration from Russia and. Uh, Japan, and the hope is that they'll come over to Alaska, and then us listers can count them. Um, 
Cool. I think maybe I'll end. I think I have the slide of the polar bear because I do emphasize at the end of the book that I'm not just a birder. I'm like you, Katie. I care about all nature and, and Mother Earth. And, and if there's anything we can do to protect it and save it, I would do that, you know, give time, give money, whatever. But I did take this picture. Um, I was in a boat in Nunavut, which is the eastern part of Canada, um, near Greenland. And the point of this picture is to say that my granddaughter, which is, I think, our final slide, if, if my granddaughter has any chance of seeing a polar bear in the wild, there she is, uh, we need to do a better job of stewarding Mother Earth. There she is. She's like one and a half. And I had the binoculars up and she literally just went and picked up the dog bones to imitate me. So um, maybe, maybe uh, unless we've missed something, I'm, I'm thinking maybe we're, maybe we're ready for the Q&A. So I could go on forever with you. It's, I have so many <laughs> questions myself. We'll I be talking they, later, George. We, we, have we will. Oh, there's stuff. Bruce. <laughs> um, I know, I know we're respecting time and I hope the audience enjoyed this and has some questions for us. So we'll see. Mute Bruce. Yeah. There you go. I, uh, I will remind the audience that the Q and A is open and you can uh, ask your questions. Um, but you know, we have a few, uh, for starters. Um, the, uh, Katie one for you. Um, to what extent are, I mean, I, I was fascinated when I watched the Ocean Warriors uh, about the 100, 100 plus day chase, mm -hmm. of the illegal fishermen. Um, when you started, when you went to make the documentary, did you have any idea what you were, where this story was headed? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you clearly, uh, you had a, a camera crew on the boat, I guess, and yeah, it was, it's a good question. And I meant to say that because it was total, it was luck, it was an accident. We had just finished producing Ocean Warriors, which was a six hour series for Discovery Channel. And we still had those two uh, camera crews were still on those two Sea Shepherd vessels. And um, when they started chasing this poacher, they were calling us like, should we keep shooting? We're like, yeah, <laughs> keep shooting. And they got this back and forth that was incredible. And I think the thing that really was educational for me is that during Ocean Warriors, we came to meet the scientists who work at Sky Truth. And that's a satellite company in West Virginia that watches all the environmental trouble that's going on around the world. They do mountaintop mining and they do oil spills. And they'd been tracking this poacher too. So we had we basically had the satellite guy on the phone, the two vessels on the you know ship to shore. And then we had uh, Paul Watson, who's the head of Sea Shepherd, who was on his own vessel, who was watching the whole thing. And, and as they moved up the coast of Africa and they're hitting Gabon and Cameroon and Nigeria, other activists are coming out to help them. So by the time they got to San Tome, there was a flotilla of people saying, mm. okay, poacher, you got to give up. And that's when he scuttled his ship. He, he just dry, he sunk the boat. Yeah, he sunk the boat, and as it was sinking, it was sideways like this. One of the guys from the well, one of the Sea Shepherd vessels put a bunch of guys into a Zodiac, and they sent him over to the to the poacher's vessel, and they got on board and they grabbed the evidence. They got right. a couple bags of the Chilean sea bass, the Patagonian tooth, toothfish, and they got the laptops and they got the charts. They got the evidence yeah. that they would later take to the courtroom, and actually they secured a conviction. So yeah. it was, but you know, it all started with like a, another series wrapping up. They just hadn't gotten to port yet. So it worked out pretty well for us. Yeah, that's great. Uh -huh. Sea Shepherd, sea Shepherd um, uh, you know, what I've read has a somewhat complicated relationship with some governments and what have you. Yeah. It seemed as though there was a lot of cooperation between the governments and Interpol and whatever between mm. Sea Shepherd and those folks in mm -hmm. the documentary and is that is that more yeah. typical now or is that yeah uh, good question i think um a lot of governments use sea shepherd as their personal navy because they can't afford to put those vessels out there and sea shepherd is privately funded by funders around the world um but the other thing i should mention is interpol we have filmed at interpol in lyon france multiple times 
They have incredible resources that they always give generously to people who want to tell these stories. And uh, I think Interpol was kind of the secret weapon in the Chasing the Thunder story because they're the ones who came out finally from Nigeria and and you know brought it home. They said, here's what you need, get this evidence, we're gonna bring it in, we're gonna go to court, here are your lawyers, you're gonna do this. And uh, and and it was Interpol who really prosecuted the case and they and they won. So that was that was amazing. And P.S. Yeah. That was the first conviction in a, an illegal fishing case in the world in ten years. It's so hard to do it. it so, so, what's like, likely to happen? Is it a fine? Is it jail time? Like, what's what's the penalty? Yeah, the captain and two the the fish mate and the first mate uh, went to jail. They're still in jail. And then the owner, who was Spanish, they were from Madrid, actually Vigo, Spain, northern Spain. Um, the owner got a fine, but the fine was only $2 million. And people say, you know, for those guys, that's like the cost of doing business. I mean, they, oh. have, they have a line item in their budget, which is bribes, fines, right. you know. Right. So I, it, they didn't stop illegal fishing with that one act, but at least they, they proved that it's, it's riskier now than that's it was good. to try to pull yeah. that off. Wow. Uh, for, for George, we have uh, actually a couple of questions, which I'll try and combine. Uh, Peter Zeising, is that oh, how I pronounce it? Zeising, yeah. high Zeising. school buddy. Zeising. High school buddy, yeah. Peter um, asks, and then we have a, a related question as well. He said, uh, George, what's your new number beyond 800? And related to that was, you have 800 in a book. What's next? Is there a new birding goal? Are you yeah. keeping lists yeah. of national birds or what? what's going on? I, I didn't plant this question, but that's a good question. And I can explain why I'm motivated to get to 846. That's my, I wanna get that before I stop existing on this earth. And it's gonna take me a while. Eight, eight, I'm at 812. And the reason is back in 1970, a year after I had set this goal for myself, I just made up this goal. I wanna see 600 by age 50. In 1970, a year later, the American Birding Association was created and they are still sort of the governing body for birders. They set the rules. They decide if a bird is one species or two species. They produce a magazine. They have a lot of programs and, and uh, community service. And so I, I'm very much a member and part of the American Birding Association. But what was strange in 1970, they created the area of lower 48, Alaska and Canada only, not Hawaii. So for 50 something years, when birders like me are accumulating their, their, their list of, it's their ABA area list being the 49 states plus Canada. And that's sort of the game we play. In 2016, finally, Hawaii was added to the ABA area. I'm sure there was years of pressure from the Chamber of Commerce and Tourism Industry because birders spend a lot of money when they travel and go to these places. So the short version is, yes, I went to Hawaii in 2017 alone. My wife didn't have the same vacation schedule. We still sort of laugh about this. Um, and I picked up 46 birds in Hawaii that are more or less endemic or only, you're only able to see them in Hawaii. Now, so yeah, my total of 812 count has 46 from Hawaii. The true old line master birders, many of whom I've been on trips with, they tend to be older than I am. They sort of uh, almost, you know, pat me on the head and said, welcome to 800, but you're really not at the true 800 because you have Hawaii. We reached 800 without <laughs> Hawaii. <laughs> and with that, I'm like, okay, dudes, I'll join your club. I'll get to 846 because I can subtract Hawaii and be at 800. That motivates me because I know some of these characters and you know they're friendly, but they really do sort of have this arrogance about them that they're the king, and I'm not really a member of their club. 
but I am. <laughs> so that's a, I guess that's a longer answer than you wanted, but good question, Peter and whoever else, but 846 is the goal. Um, very quickly from, uh, from Stu Schultz, he says, no question, but want to say how proud I am of both of you, fins up. Oh, um, yeah. Don't see. <laughs> My pickleball partner. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then uh, Steve, uh, Steve Greismer uh, asks uh, uh, for Katie, uh, the museum you mentioned sounds wonderful. Is it open to visitors yet? Oh, great question. And I hope you'll come when it is. It, unfortunately, we just broke ground, so it's going to be a while. It'll, they say it's going to be January of 26, but who really knows? It's a very ambitious project. And um, But the thing is that I really do want people to come, and, and maybe Phil and Bruce can help, and, and Kathy can help get the word out. I think all Princetonians should come, especially because the chairman of our board and the, and the founder and the head of this museum is uh, Lou Crampton, who went to Princeton, and ah. he was, later went on to be head of the EPA. He's like a big policy guy. Now he's the head of our city council. And at age 80, he doesn't stop. It just keeps on going. That's why I say, George, you and I, we just need to keep at it. Yeah. Uh, Lou, Lou is always kidding me and saying, yeah, we got to get all those Princeton people down here. But you definitely need to come down and, and give a talk, George. And Steve, I hope yeah. you'll come and visit. We'll keep everybody posted. Uh, I'm sure fundraising is still active, correct? Funding is always welcome. Yes, but they yeah. have they've already raised enough money to break ground, which is amazing. Like nobody can believe that. I mean, like seven figure, couple seven figure. Like how we were? No, we raised seventy three million. Oh, yeah. Wow. It's we're building the ground. I mean, it's I mean, that's serious. Good for it's you. Like I don't know. It's going to be in, it's going to be intense. But I'm looking forward to it. I feel like a contractor now. I'm learning about all the like owners rep meetings, telling me what's cheap and what's expensive. I'm like, I need projections on the floor of the digital exhibit gallery. And they're like, no. And I'm like, please. And they're like, okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I think okay. it'll be nice. Damn. So we have two, uh, two related uh, questions. Um, one from Joyce, Joyce Thornhill and one from uh, Phil Huber. Um, uh, Joyce asks, can we have a class birding trip? And Phil says, Katie, could we organize a class trip with you as tour guide and have George take us birding during that? So uh, that's, uh, we, we have had, as you know, we've, we have had some, uh, some class trips already that have gone very well, one of which actually involves some birding in, uh, in, the, uh, in uh, uh, Ecuador. And uh, that was oh, wow. very, it was great. Um, but uh, yeah, it seems as though uh, no good deed goes unpunished. Uh, you've now been uh, co-opted to be tour guides and lecturers for the class. <laughs> uh, you feel that like would, that I would also be awesome. see that Joyce, um, I, I got to give a shout out to Joyce because she hosted a reception, a dinner and a screening of our film, Chasing the Thunder in Washington. She's very involved in getting the message out on all these things. Thanks, Joyce. And she yeah. remembered that one of the cool things that happened in that film is that the captains withheld the, the passports so that nobody, none of the bad guys could get away because they had all their passports. Mm. And uh, remember that folks, when you're traveling internationally, keep your passport close. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I just, I saw, was it yesterday that we got a class note about a trip to Cuba, which I didn't know anything about. And, and I'm hoping my roommate and great friend, John McIntyre is on this call. He, he's got a lot of ties in with Cuba. It, is there a bird component? I can't make that trip. I yes, the ivory-billed woodpecker. The ivory-billed woodpecker. Let's Could go find still it. That's the one place in the world it could still exist is Cuba, oh, exactly. Wow. Which, which without even asking the question, you just answered Rick Perlis's question oh. <laughs> where George, does the ivory-billed woodpecker still exist? Uh, yeah, that the ghost bird. I mean, I do not think it exists in the United States. A lot of money and Nat Geo people and a lot of folks have spent a lot of time in basically Arkansas. I mean, that's the last time it was physically photographed in, in, in the Singer tract, like in the 1950s. But worldwide, there is a hope that the ivory build could still exist in Cuba because it hasn't been completely explored or discovered. 
the, so um, I hold the, the film. Hope I love I the, the hope there's out. a film that uh, George Butler made called The Ghost Bird, which Ghost aired Bird. on PBS. Right. And they describe it as the Elvis bird because they keep declaring it extinct and then it keeps getting sighted and then it gets, you know, yeah. it has left the building. So this bird is a really interesting story. We should definitely put that on the on the uh, itinerary if we can. Yeah, awesome. I just, I know my schedule for, I can't, I can't get away in April. I have a daughter wedding in March and she picked Costa Rica because Miami's too expensive. So she's having a, destination wedding in Costa Rica and I, I know I can't get away and go to Cuba too but boy I would love to do that you can see some birds in Costa Rica you'll be all right oh yeah 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 the um, oh, yeah. I, I was uh, I should mention that the uh the Cuba trip was announced yesterday and is already selling fast is it wow that trip and all of our class trips are mentioned on our class website because we've been to Ecuador and we've been to Alaska and we've been on a uh, Margaritaville cruise. And, yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. So it's uh, uh, thanks to Schultz also um, and John. Um, but uh, yeah, they're all there and they are great trips and it's a great way to uh, great way to see each other. George, do you have pictures of all 800 that you've seen or all 812? Yeah, uh, that's that's a good question. The answer is no, because I didn't really have a camera as a kid and there, I certainly know people who do document every single species not just the United States but but around the world but I have found for maybe the last 100 and it's sort of a diminishing return kind of game because the birds are obviously harder and harder to find as you climb the scale to these numbers so I do try to get a picture of every new species right now. It's not required by the birding authorities that you know keep our records and compile us and actually rank us and all this stuff. And, and I will also mention that I am sort of a purist because birders are allowed to count herd only birds. And that's because they don't want you disturbing maybe a rare bird that's nesting or something. But for me personally, I don't count the bird if I've only heard it. I want to see it and ultimately photograph it. Um, mm. But yeah, no, good question. But yeah, the last hundred, and that's sort of based on the blog. You know, it's not a good blog if I don't have a good picture. And usually the story is about one of the rare birds. So I got to have a picture of it too. Yeah. That adds a level of stress. That adds a real level of stress, which is all self-imposed. But oh God, to get a good picture is sometimes great. As you know, Katie, it's impossible. Oh cool. my God. Well, we were just talking about, uh, when we were talking before about what the next trip is gonna be. And my next trip, I have to give a shout out to Woods Hole Oceanographic for this because we've just had our expedition confirmed just this morning. Oh. We're going on an expedition out of uh, Woods Hole into the North Atlantic. It's basically a big chemistry field trip. And the scientists are, are looking for ways to enhance the alkalinity of the ocean so that they can basically use the ocean to pull carbon out of the atmosphere and to bury yeah. it in the bottom. And you know this story, it's like the world's greatest migration of these phytoplankton that go up and down every day and they pull carbon from the surface and then they put it down in the bottom. And those deep sea creatures, which we've, we're only just now discovering who they are and what they look like. I mean, one's called a siphonophore. How great a tip is that? It's a siphon O4 and it siphons the carbon out of the atmosphere and it puts it down in the bottom. And wow. so these scientists are trying to figure it out. This, this expedition, it's going to be, we go out for a, a week out of Woods Hole, laying different colored dyes, and then uh, putting these measurement devices into the water to figure out how quickly they disperse and how, uh, how quickly the phytoplankton will absorb them. And these are like, you know, I never thought I'd go to microscopic animals for, you know, widescreen TV, but it's, you know, it's like all the stories are converging now. If there's a way that marine creatures can save us from climate change, let's figure it out. Wow. What's your next location, George? Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, there, I, I haven't mentioned, but I do have my phone programmed thanks to the ABA and Cornell University where I have the rare bird reports come in every hour <gasps> because of Cornell's eBird, which is sort of a dynamic 
population sentence that's ongoing as long as birders around the world report their sightings and then Cornell regurgitates it and spits it back out. So I have my phone programmed to, to basically for any rare bird that's being seen in the United States, I, I know where, you know, they have photos and maps and whatnot. So I happen to know there's one in Florida and there's, oops. What are you that looking was, for? That was the phone call. Um, one in, that one was in, it? Oh my God. Anyway, anyway, one in Florida and there's one in Texas, but I, I, I just can't justify getting on a plane or driving to go chase one bird, although I have done that before. Come on, you went to Nova Scotia. Yeah, I know. It's hard to admit sometimes and car carbon counters and environmentalists. I get it. It, it Sometimes you, you have <laughs> to balance. Would you, would you recommend this, George? I don't know if people can see it. This is Merlin. Oh if you my! Take your goodness. phone outside, and you have Merlin. You can't really see. It Merlin. lists all the birds that you have singing in your yard. It's you don't fantastic. Even have to get binoculars. You just like boom. You have a bird list. It's so fun. It's, it's free, which I know is attractive to many. But Cornell has produced that. You download it for free, and I I used it this morning. I mean, I use it every day. <laughs> it's it's about ninety five percent accurate, and yeah, it 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 hears the song and tells you what what's around you. Yeah, anyway. really fun. This does lead to a question about uh, technology and, and training as photographers. And, and uh, did either of you, you, you obviously have, have uh, you know, lots of pictures and, and uh, did you train and have you seen uh, major changes in technology uh, that uh, influenced how? Well, how jump in. With the, amateur, the, the amateurs <laughs> jumping in. I'm a terrible. My father was a <laughs> tremendous photographer with his orchids. He understood f stops and shutter speeds and all this stuff, and I never got it. Digital cameras. As long as you persevere and you're patient and you take a lot of photos, you're going to get a good one. Right. I'm I'm really a numbskull on photography, but I get good pictures just because I stay at it. Katie, mm -hmm. you probably understand it a lot better oh, than I. I mean. <laughs> I was just going to say, uh, you know, while you were running around looking at birds and you're little with your curly hair and all your cameras and all your binocs and everything, I was trying to skip science class in, uh, you know, by finding a way to get out of it. And I actually got rid of my whole science requirement in high school by uh, doing a photo gallery of ecological pictures, you know, pictures wow. of traffic and pictures of, like I was, I was on the other side long before <laughs> We even knew what that would mean. So because I got out of my science credit, I don't know enough about ecology, but I definitely yeah. learned my way around a dark room and I learned how to take pictures. So yeah, yeah. You know, between you and me, George, we make like one whole eco tourist. Yeah, no, <laughs> te technology, it, it is an absolute game changer. And I will say this for you, Bruce, and Katie knows this and, and the others on the call, not that long ago, bird chasers like me would rely on tape recorded messages. And I, I mean, you know, maybe this was 20 years ago, but you'd call the Cape May hotline and on a Monday and, and they'd tell you what was seen a few days before, but by the time you got organized and went out, the bird's gone. You're not, you've got to be able to move quickly sometimes. And that's why this eBird app that Cornell has created is just amazing. And then that has enabled, I guess, people like me to have success for these really one-time wonder birds that might be in an area just for a day or so. So yeah, technology is, is it's incredible. Yeah. Do you ever just use your phone for pictures? Just, uh, uh, that's, you read the book. I do have a whole chapter on one of the, if not the hardest bird to photograph in America, the black rail, Katie, you know, that little, <laughs> that yeah. little creature that nobody ever sees. And I, I did spend hours with my phone over a spot in a marsh south of San Francisco. I had to recharge the phone a couple of times, but I knew this bird, I was in its breeding territory and I'm hanging my, I didn't have my camera with me because I didn't think I'd have a chance of photographing it, but I had my phone and I got a picture of the black rail from my phone after about four hours of just standing over this spot. 
Yeah, that was oh, pretty. Oh yeah, you got it. That's amazing. You, but you have to, you have to learn when and how to use the phone. The phone definitely comes in handy, but you know, yeah. on my shows, much of this is about evidence. And if you can get the evidence that there was pollution coming out of a pipe outside of Miami, or if there was, you know, a uh, a blue green algae bloom going on up in Lake Okeechobee, you can snap that with your picture with your phone. Yeah. Yep. And then send it in to the Department of Environmental Protection so that they don't, you know, so they'll stop, you know, pretending that these things are not happening. And then you can also send it into local news. So it's all it's like a it's like a circle of information that we try to keep going around here and keep uh, keep the yeah. bad guys down and the good guys up like George. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. So um, do you have any any advice, uh, either of you for uh novice novice birders or novice uh novice Sanders. heading out oh. to uh to look at the oceans or look at birds yeah i have to say and i'll jump in here katie but one of the most satisfying things for me is to take out family members or friends on just a little nature walk and i guess sort of like sports and i'll say tennis when you're a tennis player you always want to play with someone who's just a little bit better than you and you're going to improve and learn. And birding is sort of similar. There are plenty of volunteer Audubon groups in every area and, and, and bird walks probably every week of the year. And if you attach yourself to the group, you're gonna learn from the leader or others in the group. And you know, sometimes it sticks, sometimes for you know, some people it doesn't, but yeah, there are lots of opportunities. Uh, and it's just start with the basics. I mean, I still enjoy the most common birds. I'm not just a rare bird chaser. I love migration and the warblers that come through Pennsylvania every year. And it's a challenge just to sort of identify them again and see them. And it, you know, I'm lucky. I have a hobby that I'm never bored and, you know, I'll probably die out in the field somewhere, but I'll be happy. I, I, and to that, I would only add, um, you know, I'm obsessed with wildlife too, but I'm obsessed with storytelling about wildlife. And the people that I have learned from the most lately are the young ones who are just coming up in that world. And I think we can learn from the slightly better ones and we can learn from the, the slightly newbie ones because yeah. I taught, I taught uh, documentary filmmaking for three semesters at Princeton, the first was the Ferris course. And then the next two were in Princeton's campus in Kenya, which is called Impala. Oh, wow. And those two courses, I swear I learned more than any of the students. I hate to say that if there's like, I think there's some on the phone. But I just, they really, they would come, they would, they would fix the editing breakdowns in the middle of the night. They would know they if I would tell them a little bit about African wildlife and how to shoot them and what time of day, then they would they would return the favor in spades with helping yeah. me understand how to how to frame those stories and how to not just to do the technical support, but to do the the actual communication of that. And I think, you know, we hired one of my students from the last course and he works for us now. He he Brady. He lives in, uh, well, I've told you about him. He lives in LA and he, you know, he's a real live movie filmmaker, but when he can, he steals away and does nature films. So I wow. think the students that I've had and other young people on our teams have just really opened my eyes to how great this opportunity is. So yeah, listen to the youngins, especially your kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Great, well, I think we've kind of coming toward the end of our time here. Uh, and I'd like to thank both of you on behalf of all of the attendees who are obviously silenced and, and can only thank you in writing. Uh, but I'd like to, I would like to thank you both for sharing the stories with us. Hey. Today. I thought it was an engaging and entertaining presentation and very informative. A recording of this webinar will be available on the Princeton 1979 YouTube channel. And this joins all of our previous authors and artists session recordings. Uh, I would encourage you to watch our class website and social media for an announcement of the next installment in the series. And obviously we hope to see everyone at the 45th reunion next May. Mm -hmm. I believe it's 45 years, but uh, uh, it, it is. And we hope everyone will be there. Thank, thank you all. You, so. Thank you. Thank you all. This, this was a blast. Thank you.
the whole team. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we yeah, had great, fun. great work. Proud of class of 79. I, I, I don't know if other classes do this, but really well done, Bruce, Phil, Kathy, and Katie. Too much fun. Yeah, we've got a lot to talk much about. Much fun. I'll talk to you later, George. <laughs> All right. Cheers. Bye-bye. Later.